Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC. I appreciate you guys having me today and giving me the opportunity to speak. I was 100% in the right place at the right time. I'm not any good. I really wasn't that good. I just, <laughs> I just picked right. And, uh, and I, I did contemplate going back in 13. Um, I, had a, I had an offer from the Red Sox, which would have been cool. And I had an offer from the Yankees and, uh, and was talked out of that. So that, that would have been one. Three in a row, that definitely – Go to the casino with that one. But I uh, appreciate you guys having me. September 4th, um, 2005, I was called up. I, I got a phone call. I was pulled off a bus um, in Jackson, Tennessee. We were headed to Jacksonville, Florida to play in the AA um, playoffs for minor league baseball. My manager, Bobby Dickerson, looked toward the end of the bus. I had already paid my money to buy my poker chips, and I was saddling in for about a 12-hour drive. Uh, which was going to be miserable. And he looked to the back of the bus and he says, uh, and he says, Ryan, uh, I need you to come up here. And I thought I had done something or whatever, but because um, we did sneak beer on and we weren't supposed to have beer on. And, and uh, he says, you're, you're going to the major leagues. You got called up. You're, you're headed to San, San Diego. You're flying out today. Um, then he announced it to the team and, uh, and everybody went crazy on the bus. And, and it was a dream come true for me. The emotions that I experienced at that, at that point, as you guys can imagine, um, were extremely overwhelming. And, and it was something that I had dreamt about my entire life and truthfully didn't ever feel like it was going to happen. The minor leagues are a grind. Um, you know, the first emotion that, that came to me was, was one of relief. Um, I have some friends in the audience, obviously my little brother, and so he understands this better than anybody. The minor leagues can be extremely taxing on not only the body but, and the mind, but also the bank account. Uh, you get paid peanuts. And, uh, and I was married, and I had my first child. I'd been born you know, a few months before that. So we didn't have the luxury of, of rooming with, with other players. We had to get our own place. Otherwise, I'd have been divorced a couple months into that thing. <laughs> And so it wasn't looking too good financially. So, so now I can buy diapers, right? I can check that box. Um, uh, there was a sense of pride that came over me at that moment as well. Um, you know, when you work so hard for something and, and sacrifice so much for it, and then it becomes a reality, uh, it, it, you, you, you grin from ear to ear. I can remember going back to our apartment, packing it up, and, and my wife and I, Jonna, at the time, you know, we, we just look at each other and just, you know, start crying because it's like you give so much and then you're just proud. You're proud of not only the accomplishment, but you're proud of all those in your life that helped you get there. You know, and then, and then lastly, I would say gratification. And when I, when I mean gratification, uh, it, it, was almost like a, it was almost like one of those things where it, it's, it's true. Like if you work hard... Um, Things happen, but, but then there were so many people in my life that were able to put me in that position to get that phone call to realize a dream. Um, Ms. Frances England was the principal at Broadmoor Elementary when I was there. She was four foot nothing. <laughs> and, and I don't know how old she was when I was there, but, it, but she seemed pretty old. She's since passed. Um, <laughs> Ms. Frances England taught me that, that small size, if you're up in years a little bit, doesn't mean that you can't be respected and doesn't mean that your voice doesn't carry a ton of weight and also doesn't mean that you can't rule with an iron fist. And boy, she did. I can promise you that. And, 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 and I still remember the way she would talk and the things that I took from her um, I couldn't have got from anybody else. Uh, Mr. Daryl Morris, and I don't know if you guys know Mr. Morris, but he was my principal at Sherwood Middle School. I'm a proud Falcon. Um, Mr. Morris had, a, had an open door policy in middle school, which is odd, where we, you know, we all felt comfortable going in and talking to him. I actually went on my first deer hunting trip, trip with Mr. Morris. Um, he was kind and he treated everyone equally. No matter where your status was within the school, Mr. Morris treated everybody the same. Um, Brian Vaughn from Broadmoor High School, I called him Coach Vaughn because he coached my dad when he was at Broadmoor. Um, and Mr. Vaughn was my principal when I was, when I was at Broadmoor. 
Mr. Vaughn rewarded those who excelled. Meaning, if you did what you were supposed to do, and if you took care of your business in the classroom, and then outside of the classroom, you got rewarded from Mr. Vaughn. On the flip side of that, if you didn't, he came down on you pretty hard. I learned from those three people, those three principals, early in my life, I took, I took different things from them. Obviously, Miss England at Broadmoor Elementary taught me that it didn't matter what you looked like or how big you were, if you said what you wanted to say with conviction, people would listen. Mr. Morris, like I said, the open door policy, but also when you treat others the way that you want to be treated, you command respect. Mr. Vaughn, staying true to his word, doing what he said he was going to do, and then rewarding. These are all things that helped mold me into the, the man I am today and prepare me for that day in, in September in 2005. Skip Bertman was my coach at LSU, and, and I'm sure all you guys are familiar with Skip. Um, he won five national titles in 10 years, in a 10-year span, the most dominant uh, college sports team, you know, ever in that decade, and I was fortunate to be a part of it in 2000. Skip taught me mental toughness, visualization, and belief in yourself are more important than measurables. And when I say measurables, they're more important than how tall you are, how fast you run, how much weight you lift. Skip taught me that you could will yourself to victory. He would talk about seeing success. He'd make us close our eyes. We thought it was super corny. Most of us were hungover and we fell asleep. But he would do it in team meetings. He'd be like, I want you guys, ooh, I'm not going to do that. I want you guys to visualize success. And so we'd close our eyes and you'd see the success happening. You'd see yourself making a great play or, or getting a, a big hit in a big moment to the point where when I scored the winning run in 2000, I took my helmet off and I fired it over the backstop in Rosenblatt Stadium. And it wasn't premeditated. What happened was Skip had made us watch this video of Armando Rios 15 years before that doing the exact same thing. It just happened. I'd seen it and it had been engraved in my mind and it just happened. Skip taught me the importance of visualization, mental toughness. Dusty Baker, who's one of my favorite men on this planet, was my first major league manager, Chicago Cubs. Um, Dusty was one of those guys that, uh, he was an old school baseball guy. He played in the major leagues and, um, and, and and Dusty would, respect was earned and not given with Dusty. Why, that was so important for me because rookies didn't have to sit on the bench and waste away. If you played well, you got an opportunity. Dusty gave me my first chance. Lou Pinella uh, was my second manager in Chicago. Um, you know, Lou Pinella was similar to Dusty, um, but but Lou really valued, um, he valued hard work and dedication. Um, Lou wanted you to be challenged. You, he wanted to challenge you each and every day. He wanted to challenge us. And then in turn, we would challenge him. Lou, Lou welcomed new opportunities, new ideas, new thoughts. He also welcomed Tito's and water. Um, <laughs> but that's for a whole nother. He legit, honestly, I was playing shorts. It's a funny loose story. I don't have this written down, but this is really good. Um, I was playing shortstop. It was a day game, and I'm playing shortstop in Chicago. And Lou, Lou would, he kind of had a limp, and so he would he'd balance himself. Oh, y'all can, can hear me. He'd balance himself by touching his leg like this so he wouldn't fall over. I think it was the Tito's. <laughs> so he's going to take Carlos Sembrano out of the game. Um, and he literally walked straight to me at shortstop. <laughs> he never looked up. And he looks at me, he's like, oh, son, sorry about that. And he just goes over to <laughs> And he always had the little cup, and it was clear, and I'm like, uh... But he was amazing, honestly, uh, and a great guy to play for. Tony LaRusso, who I had in, in, in St. Louis. 
Tony, and I'll challenge anybody, is the greatest baseball mind to ever walk this planet. Mind. Um, boy, he expected greatness from us. He wouldn't settle for anything less. Um, he was so prepared in everything that he did. You guys could about imagine it's 162 games in about 180 days is what we do. Um, we have a spring training which consists of about 40 games. So let's say we're at 200, 210 days and we play about 200 games. And so you could imagine it turns into Groundhog Day, right? You eat the same thing, you wear the same clothes, you show up the same time. Tony, I don't know how he did it, but he treated every day like it was a new day. He researched, he would stay up all night. The guy never slept uh, to the point in 2011, we're playing Milwaukee in the playoffs and it was at Milwaukee. And I get to the field at about noon. Uh, I guess it's this time of year uh, in 2011. And I go and they have the lineup posted and I wasn't in the lineup. So I'm pissed. I was a veteran at the time, and I had, I had some, some gripes because I, I was about a career 400 hitter in Miller Park, which is where the Brewers play, and the guy that was pitching, I destroyed his entire career, okay? And I'd already re I knew that. Like, I was expecting to play this game, and I knew that the matchup was good for me and all that, and so I go into Tony's office. Skip, you got a second? He says, yeah, come on in. So I go in, slam the door. You know, I'm pissed. I want him to know I'm pissed. And, uh, and so I tell him, hey, man, you know, this is bull. Like, here's my numbers. This is what I do, you know, against this guy. This is my park. The ball looks big here. I just like it, whatever. And he broke out, he broke out these little um, post-it, little yellow post-it deals, and he had scribbled stats and they're all over his office, by the way. It's, it's extremely uh, overwhelming to, to get anywhere in his office. But he says, no, when the temperature's below 70 degrees, <laughs> and it's after Halloween, <laughs> and, uh, you know, whatever. He, he, so he's like, Ryan, in, in those scenarios, you're a 130 hitter, man. You can't, you can't hit. <laughs> and, <laughs> all right, you got me. But he was so prepared, you guys. It's unbelievable. He's best friends with Bill Belichick, obviously. Um, and and, uh, and I, learned, I learned a ton from Tony as far as being prepared and, and, and being over-prepared for things, for situations. Um, and my last, my last uh, I'm going to call him a principal, but, but um, I guess they're not principals. My last manager in the big leagues was, was uh, Bruce Bochy. And Boch just recently retired. He's a manager out in San Francisco. Um, he looks like Shrek. He's got a giant head. And Boach and I hit it off well initially. He's, got a, he's a big hunter. He's got an elk in his office. And he's really cool and, and uh, former player as well. What I took away from Boach um, was, and I believe this, I believe each team, I know everybody in here is leaders, business owners, uh, leaders in the community, and, and you look at yourselves as a leader um, you know, or as a manager of a team, and, and I kind of do that at Traction, but, but Boach taught me that each team takes on the persona or the attitude, the emotions of their leader, and that's true. Um, Lou Pinella was nuts. Therefore, Carlos Zambrano was nuts, and Jacques Jones was nuts, and all the guys on the team were nuts because Lou was nuts. Bruce was the exact opposite to the point where we had some situations in 2012 where it seemed as if we, were, we weren't going to win. He was so cool under pressure. He never let his emotions get too high and never get too low. If you want to be successful on the baseball field, you have to avoid these guys and avoid these guys. You want to kind of be even keel. I tell young guys all the time, uh, a base hit and a walk, that's all you should do, and you'll hit 350, and you'll make a whole lot of money. But people get greedy, and they want to hit you know, four for four, but Boach was that guy. He taught me um, that if you stay even keel and if you stay consistent in what it is that you do, you'll have success. Um, and and I, I appreciate the heck out of Boach for that. The reason I mention all, all those people, these are, these are people that in my life have influenced me and, and created the man that I am today. 
what I've always tried to do is take things from everybody, people that I feel are better than me. I've tried to surround myself with people that I feel are better than me. And then I try to, I try to learn from them. There's not a book that you can read. There's not an audio book you can download or a website you can subscribe to to, to learn how to become a great leader. Um, I pride myself on leading. I was voted team captain on multiple teams that I've been on. All I've done is tried to take the best from all those people that I just mentioned and bottle it up into one. I was so fortunate to be surrounded by so many great managers, principals, leaders in my life. Um, and, we, and truthfully, you guys, we all have experiences uh, and people in our lives that, that give us those tools to be great. Um, it's, it was never just okay for, for me to be average. Um, I was always an overachiever. I think a lot of us in this room could probably look in the mirror and go, yeah, we're doing good, but could you do better? And the answer to that is absolutely, you could do better. Um, and the way that you do that, and the way that I've done that, is I've tried to harness you know, all those people from the past and just think, what would, what would Tony do in this situation? You know, how would he handle X, Y, or Z? Um, what would, would Miss England do? Um, you know, obviously fortunate to be, be close with Skip, so I can call Skip. Say, hey man, you know, how would you handle this? Um, but I've tried to take the tools that all those people have given me and apply them in, in my day-to-day -day life. You know, obviously attraction, um, which you can ask questions later kind of about that, but in traction, uh, in, in the way that I interact with my children, um, the relationship and the way that I interact with my wife, my friends, um, you know, and, and what I can say, and it's been hard for me to do this, but you have to be humble enough to ask questions. Does that make sense? Like, like don't ever assume that, that you can figure out the answer on your own. Don't be so egotistical to know or to think that you have it all figured out. Use the resources that are around you and ask questions. I, I, that's helped me quite a bit. Um, you have to be smart enough, though, to listen to the answers when you ask the question. Right? We do it all the time. We ask a question, and then we think about the next question we're going to ask rather than listen to the answer that was just given. Okay? Um, that was a hard thing for me. Because you guys that know me out here know my mind goes a thousand miles an hour. So once I started slowing that down, uh, it helped. And then you have to be hungry enough to apply the information that you've gotten into your everyday life or into your business. That makes sense? I get the question all the time, why did you retire from baseball? Physically, you look like you're in good shape. I was. It could be argued that I was at the top of my game. I mean, had a couple good seasons in a row, got a couple rings, and I'm wearing this one because of the Cardinals, by the way. Got a big game, game five, go Cards. <laughs> um, I didn't have the hunger anymore, right? Yeah, I, I, I called my older brother after the season, and, and I told him I was going to retire, and he said I was a moron, and um, <laughs> retired on the largest, it was the largest, it would have been my largest contract that, that I left on the table that year, um, but it wasn't what was filling me up inside anymore, right? Um, as a kid at Broadmoor Elementary, we had career day. In Miss Corona's class, it's crazy, I remember all their names. Miss Corona's class. The girl next to me, I don't remember her name, but she wanted to be an astronaut and I made fun of her. <laughs> the guy to my left wanted to be a, a fireman, I made fun of that. I wanted to be a baseball player, they all made fun of me. It was, you know, I made a decision early on in first grade that that's what I wanted to do, and then I did it. And I, I was so dedicated and hungry to get to that point and get there and get there and get there and then life happens. And then the hunger wasn't quite there. It became a chore to get up. And I know some of you guys out here can go, you gotta be kidding me. You get to go to Wrigley Field, that's your work, like that's your office and you don't wanna go do that. But, 
but it happens. And yes, I could have kept playing and kept cashing checks. And yeah, absolutely. And people do that. You, it happens more than you know. Let me just say that. When you turn on a professional game, more than you know, the ones that are doing it aren't hungry anymore. It's convenient. It's all they know. And I didn't want to get to that point where it was miserable for me anymore, right? Um, I had three children at home, a wife that I loved. I'd lost touch with family, friends because of it, right? So it's taxing and wearing. And I wanted to wake up in the morning and be excited to do something again. I, you guys, I used to get up at 5.15, he'll tell you. I pissed everybody off in my house. <laughs> I'd get up at 5.15, I'd go outside, I'd wake everybody up, I'd go run. Like, it, it got me out of bed in the morning. Baseball got me out. I want to be a pro, I want to play in the major leagues, I want to be great. And then when you achieve it, things kind of change a little bit. The, the, and I wanted that hunger again, and I wanted to feel that feeling, and baseball couldn't do it anymore. You know, thank God for, and Eddie's over here. Put your hand up, Eddie. Thank God, Eddie's one of my partners at Traction. Thank God for Eddie and Mac Chuili, our CEO at Traction, for allowing me to be part of that team again, for giving me that hunger again, and watch out sports performance world. Because what I try to do is apply that same hunger, apply that same will to win and succeed in the business world today. And it's, there's a few things that I've done, um, you know, since Traction's kind of at the forefront right now. Um, but to recreate that, and, and I want to challenge everybody in here today to, to, to think back when you started your careers, your professional careers. This is an awesome group. Truthfully, I've never spoke to a group like this. It's so diverse um, with so many professionals. But... I want to challenge you to think back to the hunger before you had the Rolex on your wrist, right? Or the Mercedes or the big house. Like, think back. What made you get up in the morning? And what drove you to be great? You know what I'm saying? And if you can apply that every day, oh, my God. And I know it's taxing and it's hard. And for me, it was removing myself from one situation and putting myself in another. Um, I'm not saying do that because I was probably stupid, <laughs> truthfully. <laughs> well, I wish <laughs> I laugh all the time. Like, if I did just stay one more year, well, Christmas would be a little bit different this year. <laughs> My poor kids, they got screwed. <laughs> but I, I, I want to challenge you guys to try to find that feeling again and try to recreate that. And, and, and it, it, it's dangerous and it's refreshing and it's fulfilling all at the same time. Um, so I guess we got some time. We got questions? But I appreciate you guys having me uh, come out today and speak. If you guys have any questions about, uh, about anything at all, um, shoot. Look, I kept a house in Baton Rouge my entire time. I was uh, born and raised. I'm proud, like I said, Broadmoor Elementary, Sherwood Middle, Broadmoor High School. Shout out to the Bucks. Am I got anything? <clears throat> yes, sir. In college and then in pros, what was the worst place you played? The worst? <laughs> Mississippi State sucks. I don't care how you do it. <laughs> yeah. No, Mississippi State's brutal. It, actually, it's great now. Mississippi State is it is beautiful, and we are kind of in trouble because their facilities are really nice. And, yes. Oh, God, we could be here all day. <laughs> you know, I'm going to speak about my experience because I can't speak on anybody else's. I went to LSU because I played cup ball behind the bleachers as a kid growing up. I went to the games. It's the only ticket that our parents could afford. It's cheap. And I loved it. I went, be I went to put, it on, put on the purple and gold. I went because Ben McDonald was there. I went because... Todd Walker and Rush Johnson, like I went to LSU because I loved LSU. That has changed. You know, we train, we train high-end athletes at Traction. We train the elite level five-star high school kid. 
you know, the, the Derek Stingleys of the world. And I can tell you the <clears throat> what's changed is, and it's not for everybody, but they get representation much sooner, meaning agents or advisors. They understand the financial part of, of professional sports much sooner. Um, do I think they should get paid from the school? Absolutely not. That's where this whole thing, I think, gets messed up. The school's not, they're not proposing the school pay them. You know, um, but then it opens up a whole can of worms. I'll tell you, if you could ask me, if you asked me which uniform would you go put on again and go play, I, I would say Broadmoor. And here's why. There was no ulterior motives by anybody. All we wanted to do, Coach Hill just wanted us to win the state title. That was it. You know, it, my freshman, sophomore year at Broadmoor. Because junior and senior colleges are recruiting you. So then it get, the waters get a little muddy. And there's a hierarchy in the clubhouse. But in, in college sports and even in professional sports, man, everybody's got ulterior motives. There's, there's everybody else, you know, in professional sports it's worse. You got families, you know, it's just, you know, so I think you're opening up a can of worms to answer your question. I think you're opening up a can of worms that could go down a number of rabbit holes. And I don't, I don't know that it would be good, honestly. San Francisco and St. Louis were, were neck and neck, like right there. Um, <clears throat> probably San Francisco was the most professional run. And that stuff starts from the top. That's ownership. Now, when I was in Chicago, the Wrigley Company, who, the Tribune, um, owned the Cubs. And they were going through a sale to the Ricketts family, who now owns the Cubs. So, so the ownership was kind of in flux, and it wasn't a great situation. Um, up there. The tradition in St. Louis uh, is great, very professional run organization. My experience in LA, and I did not, I left off one manager off of this list, who's a Hall of Fame manager, by the way, Joe Torrey, because he had totally checked out. So my experience in LA sucked. Um, but man, San Francisco was so professionally run, dude. It was like, you know, it's, it's no, it's, it, it, everything worked. It's leadership, you know, the owners, from the ownership all the way down to the clubhouse attendance, you know, so San Fran for sure. Just too far. David? Hey, Ryan, thanks for coming today. I'd uh, be interested to hear your opinion on youth sports today versus the experience that you had when you yeah. were coming up um, as someone who's you know, professionally kind of managing a lot of the youth sports. Mm -hmm. Man, I fought it, dude. Uh, right when I retired, I fought it. I, I, I didn't like the direction that youth sports was going into, baseball in particular. Um, I hate the year-round stuff, first off. Um, you know, what I loved about my experience in youth sports was you, you would create the neighborhood league scenario where now um, everything's a tournament deal, right? You play on the weekends and you travel and do all that stuff. And so... Well, I was anti-youth baseball for a couple of years, and then I realized it was a train on the tracks that couldn't be stopped. Um, truthfully, I probably held my son back a little bit from a developmental standpoint because I refused to do it. Um, and and uh, what, what we try to do at Traction is, is do it a little bit better. Like, we put pitch counts on the kids, and they can't play three weekends in a row. And so we have some rules. But man, it's crazy, dude. But there was crazy, there was craziness when I was playing, you know. Um, to temper expectations, I think is important. You know, to stress the life skills rather than the end goal. Getting there is important. We try to do those things. Um, you know, but but I will say this: the kids today are so much farther ahead. You know, and I see Josh in the back. Josh was the best pitcher I ever faced in little league, but. The kids today know so much more about the game and skill-wise than I did. It's unbelievable. I have eight-year-olds turning double plays like they're in the major leagues. You know, I don't know if that's good or bad, 
I know we're coaching them up pretty good. Um, but man, it's it's definitely different. Yeah. Keith. Uh, Ryan, we've all heard uh, Skip Burton stories from other uh, ex players. <laughs> we're just wondering what your favorite Skip Burton story is that you played for for three years. <laughs> um, oh man. I guess I can tell some of them in here. I don't see any young youngsters. <laughs> so I think it was Auburn, and I, this is my favorite because it was me that did it. But we were we were in Auburn. I was a freshman, and Trey McClure, who I used to be the bat boy for when I was a little leaguer, is on the team. He's a senior. I was a freshman. Um, I was on third base. Tie game. McClure hits a ball over the fence. I start jogging home, touch home plate, take my helmet off. I'm high-fiving people because now we're winning. Only the ball didn't go over the fence. The dude caught it and doubled me up at third base. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, we end up losing the game. Skip was so mad, he didn't even say anything to me, which is – and I tell my sons all the time, like, when the coach doesn't talk to you, now you're in trouble. <laughs> like, when he's yelling at you and stuff, it means he still cares. When he doesn't say anything, like, now – so he didn't say a word to me. So we're on the plane um, we're flying back. It was getaway days, last day. And Coach Canterbury comes running to the back of the plane, like, on a full sprint in the flight. And what the hell did you do, Ryan? And I look at him like, what are you talking about? Skip just passed out. I think he's having a heart attack. <laughs> He came to and goes, Jesus Christ, Terrio's going to kill me. <laughs> like, and then he passed out again. So I'm like, I didn't do it. What do you want me to so, He had so many, uh, there's uh, so many great ones. He, he made me take batting practice in his Rolex one time because he said he wanted me to, f to feel what it was like to be a pro. You know, he was just, he and I always had a real special connection. I mean, I went to those camps from when I was three years old all the way up. So, you know, I've still got the picture of me sitting on his knee, taking the picture, you know, at, at his camp. So um, I, I, there's plenty of people that can say that, but, um, but we, we're still very close to this day. I like to think I'm his favorite. <laughs> Ryan, you mentioned being a champion and you lost the homer, so you started traction. What is your ultimate goal for traction? And what does it look like to be a champion yeah, so traction, let me, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll explain what it is first. We're a physical therapy, we own physical therapy clinics, sports physical therapy. We also provide therapy to, to, to people that aren't athletes, but I feel like we're the leader in the industry in that, in, in the Southeast for sure, we're probably pushing nationwide. We have athletes, I, I mean, I get guys, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball guys that aren't from here that fly in just to get treatment at our, at our clinics. So. It's therapy, sports performance, um, strength conditioning, speed development, uh, regeneration. Um, we train the high-end athletes. We train collegiate athletes. We train uh, prep athletes. We train adults. We train kids that aren't athletes. We just train them all as if they were Odell Beckham or Alex Bregman, right? So it's a it's a, it's a concept, and Eddie can tell you, that, that we kind of came up with and have molded. Um, we, and we don't in guarantee results, but we, it, is, it is training with a purpose to the T, right? Pro guy goes in, hey, I need to get a step faster. I need to lose 3% body fat. Okay, here's your diet. Here's how much you're going to sleep. Here's how much water you're going to drink. Here's when you're going to train. This is when you're going in the uh, – so we train everybody that way. My goal for the company – um, the leader in our industry is probably Exos, formerly known API, it's called Athletes Performance, but Exos is a nationwide uh, company. They have presence all over the place. Um, I would say we're a hybrid Exos and IMG, right? So we do provide some team type stuff in events and tournaments. If you guys have driven down Burbank, you're probably pissed at me <laughs> because of the traffic and, the, and all that. But we've got 42 acres right there on Burbank, and, and um, so we host events and have teams and do all that stuff, but um, it's really a lot more than that. We've kind of merged them together. I, I want to be the leader in that industry. We opened our second facility, uh, what, Eddie, a couple months ago? 
um, in Hattiesburg. Um, and so we've got a, a beautiful park, beautiful facility there. We're in negotiations with two other cities, one really big city. So it'll be our third and fourth um, facilities. And uh, I, I, I mean, I want to take over the entire space, truthfully. And, 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 and that's, and we worked so hard at it. We, I am blessed to have great people around me. Obviously, Eddie and Mac Chiwili, our CEO. Brad Cressy, you guys probably know Brad, but Brad runs my youth, the youth side for me. Uh, you know, Sherry Mockler, who's been in this community for years and years, runs my adult side. She's unbelievable. Bo Lowry runs physical therapy. He just so happens to be the head PT and rehab specialist for the Saints and Pelicans. So we, we've, we've got a team of, like, studs. And, uh, and so it's just, for me, it's um, how far can I push them? And then can I find people to replicate them, which is the challenge. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC.